Hello everyone and welcome back for more Flute Tube. I'm calling this season two of Flute Tube because it's the very beginning of a new school year. And as you can see, I'm back in my office. Not for much though, I'm just here today basically for the first time in several weeks. I'm here to meet and talk with some of my students and then we continue lessons remotely. So if you're happy to see Flute Tube continue, if you want me to keep doing these episodes through the school year, maybe like this video, subscribe, leave a nice comment to encourage me to keep going. But what I want to do mostly this season is mention things that I always talk about first thing in the school year with students, but that are going to be a little more complicated to address this year while we're having lessons over Zoom. So today we're talking about flute balance because this is a really critical topic I always bring up at the beginning of the school year. And usually I'm a lot more hands-on with my students about this one, but we'll just do the best that we can from a distance. Balancing the flute is trickier than you might think. I didn't know how to do it until I was 15 and I had a teacher come along and fix everything. When I was 12, I was playing in a master class for Leon Baizy and I was playing the Ebert Concerto third movement, and that's very tricky, but I was getting all the right notes, everything was fine, but she told me that what I should worry about with my fingers is that they were really high above the keys. So she said, be sure that you put your fingers closer down on the tops of the keys at all times, so you're not coming down slapping them like that. So I went home, and we had a full-length mirror at home that I used often when I was practicing, and I stood in front of the mirror for several days and practiced Ebert and looked at my fingers and yes, they were high and I could not figure out how to get them to sit on the tops of the keys. As soon as I started to move them, they wanted to go high, especially my right hand. And so eventually I just decided, well, maybe my hands will still grow. Maybe my fingers just aren't built that way. <laughs> Maybe they just won't sit on the tops of the keys. And I kind of gave up. But when I was 15, I had several lessons with a teacher named Joan Bauman, who had studied with Michelle Dubost at the Paris Conservatory. And she explained this concept of how to balance your flute that completely changed my hand position. And I realized a few weeks later, after I had changed my position, I was standing in front of that full-length mirror practicing something, and I saw that just on their own, my fingers now were sitting on the tops of the keys. I didn't have to try to put them there. There was nothing keeping them from doing that naturally, and it was because I had changed my position. The key to where your fingers are going to be, especially your right hand fingers, really is where the thumb is. The thumb is the culprit. It's because most people put their thumb under the flute too much that it bends your wrist, it puts pressure on all of these tendons, and then your fingers are gonna be high. So the key to this hand position is to be sure your thumb is not too far forward. And we talked about this in episode two. So if you want a more general refresher about finger technique, I would definitely suggest going back and reviewing episode two. But today we're going to talk very specifically about flute balance. What I think is most important to do to get the balance on your flute is to realize that what you need is a big paradigm shift. When you first put a flute in your hands, especially if you're a kid and the flute is pretty big for you, you're going to think of holding the flute up. So that's why we get in trouble with this thumb, because we think we have to hold it up. And then you have to counterbalance with this pinky and kind of push it down, because we just keep this pinky on so much of the time. So then you've got all this pressure in your right hand, because your thumb's kind of pushing up, your pinky's pushing down. Whenever I see a right angle right here, that's a big red flag, because that means you're pushing a lot with this pinky. The other thing to me that's a big red flag is if this palm on your right hand is really closed up or looks really tight and tense. You want your palm to be open and you want your pinky to have no extra pressure on it. It should be able to move up and down just as easily as all your other fingers. So even though it can help with balance, 
you don't want to rely on it for balance in any way. You can just move it, it'll just be curved and naturally relax like all your other fingers. Back to the big paradigm shift that I mentioned. What you have to start thinking is that you're not holding your flute up and down. You're not balancing it vertically. You're going to balance it horizontally. So this thumb, instead of holding the flute up, it's gonna act like a vector that's pushing sideways this way. And then your big solid joint right here at the base of your first finger is a pivot point. You wanna be sure the flute's not resting on this finger because that puts too much pressure on the finger. But so you're pushing with this thumb and this is a pivot point. Basically, if your chin were not there, your flute would just spin. It would just spin around because you're pushing with that thumb. But your chin counterbalances your thumb. So your, your thumb is pushing this way, you've got this pivot point, and then your chin stops the flute from spinning. That means that you have three important contact places on your flute that give you balance. Your thumb, this joint, and your chin. And I can balance my flute very easily without having any fingers down. I can jump, I can skip, I can go up and down stairs. Nothing is going to cause the flute to fall out of my hands or cause me to need to use other fingers to balance. If you came up to me while I'm holding the flute like this and pulled on my head joint, I could counterbalance. I could push harder and I could keep my flute in place while you tried to take it away from me. I have students do that in real life when I see them in real life with my flute. There are two big important goals that are accomplished by holding your flute this way. One is what we've been talking about, that all of your fingers can be equally relaxed and curved. You're not putting pressure on any of your fingers to help balance. Of course, they all help balance when they're pushed down, but when they're not, it's just these three balance points that are going to take care of the balance for you. So your fingers can all be equally relaxed and curved and happy. The other big goal that is accomplished by holding your flute this way is that your right wrist can go straight back. If you're going to pinch someone or grab a tissue or something like that, your thumb is going to be farther back than your fingers. So you just maintain that. You just put your thumb where it naturally goes relative to your fingers, and that's going to have it be farther back on the tube here. But that's what's going to keep your wrist straight because as soon as you move your thumb forward, that wrist is going to bend and that's going to put extra pressure on all of your finger tendons, which you absolutely don't want. One note that I will say is that I always clip my fingernails because I play the piano a lot, but as a flute player, this thumbnail is the one nail I have to keep very short. It's getting a little bit long right now. I cut it more than once a week for sure because as soon as it starts to get long, it makes my thumb kind of want to collapse this way. But I want this thumb to go straight into my flute so that those joints are flexible, but neither this joint nor that joint, neither one of them is going to lock or, or get tight in any way. They're going to stay flexible going into my flute. I'm sure you have the idea now that you are going to be pushing with this thumb in the most relaxed way possible, but since that's the force helping to hold up your flute, it will be pushing a bit. Keep in mind your flute's very light, just a little over a pound probably, depending on the materials that are used making your flute. So it shouldn't cause hand problems. This should relieve hand problems, make it less likely that you'll have tendonitis in the future because you'll be relieving tension off of these tendons here. But how much you push is a pretty personal matter. I heard James Galway say once, somebody asked him if he really pushed with this thumb. And he said, I'm pushing so hard that if you, if someone came up and chopped off my head, my head would fly against the back wall. So he believes in pushing, or at least he did. Um, I imagine he still does. I push kind of selectively. If I'm moving my fingers a lot, especially if I'm going between C and D or something where I have a lot of fingers moving, 
I'll push more to give myself a little bit more stability as my fingers are moving. I know some high level professionals who even though they basically hold their flute the same way, they always say to themselves and any students, try not to push, try not to push. So even though they're kind of relying on that to hold the flute up, they're trying to use their fingers and other methods to help balance so that they don't have to push very hard. So I just would be careful about how much you push because some people's hands have more tolerance than other people's hands. I just like to go gentle on my hands and I've never had any trouble with tendonitis in spite of many, many hours spent with my flute. The last thing that I want to talk about today is how to make that paradigm shift from thinking about holding your flute up and down to holding it horizontally because every flute player starts out thinking of holding it up and down and then you have all these habits associated with your flute that are very hard to break. So what I like to have people do is get their flutes out of their hands, pick up a stick, like maybe your cleaning rod, or you could go to a craft store and get a wood doily that's about the size of your flute if you're that ambitious. But if you have just a stick like this and you hold it up against your chin, it's very intuitive to just use those three places that we've been talking about for balance. In fact, it's very counterintuitive, it's very illogical and fussy to put your thumb underneath, push down with this pinky, and then hold it this way. You would just never think to do it that way with a stick like this. So just feel how natural it is to balance this way. And then, like I was saying earlier, go up and down some stairs, jump and skip, feel like this is just kind of glued against your chin because you're pushing with your thumb here and that you've got all the stability that you want out of this little stick. When your muscle memory has processed that a bit and it feels really natural to do this, go back to your flute and recognize that your flute is just a big stick. We get so much mental stuff wrapped up around our flute because we spend so long trying to figure this thing out. But tell yourself, it's just a big stick. It's only about a pound and you can balance it the same way. And what you wanna check is that your right hand fingers feel really relaxed. They're just sitting on the tops of the keys. They're naturally curved. If you can tell that that has successfully happened, then the victory has been won. Congratulations, you have achieved the right balance with your flute.